this video, we're looking at the Shapoko HDM. I've been using it for 10 months, and you may have seen some of my previous videos where I did the unboxing, we built the enclosure, upgraded the fixture table, and even built some multi-operational parts. Over the past several months, I've been doing some pretty major and systemic upgrades to the machine, and I want to talk about the rationalization and what actually went into those upgrades from the hardware, controller, and software perspective. Stick around. Welcome back. As I mentioned in this video, we'll be talking about the Shapoko HDM, my experience using it over the last 10 months, and some recent upgrades and justification of the machine from the ground up, from the hardware, controller, and software perspective. So let's dive in. But first, I want to start off by saying, you know, I don't have anything against Carbide 3D. I think the HDM and the product that they brought to market is a very solid platform. Uh, it just falls short in several areas that, for me, um, needed to be addressed. Uh, now, maybe they'll iterate on it and evolve the capabilities of the machine or, or their machine portfolio over time, which I'm sure they will. We're seeing that now with the new release of uh, the Shapoko 5 and the additional capabilities enhancements in the, the cut area and the design of the linear rails. And, and so I, I think there's a lot of promise. But for me, I wanted to address them more so over waiting for them to bring new products and capabilities to market. That said, the HDM out of the box is a strong and solid performer, but it will leave you wanting more. As you uh, develop and grow as a machinist and begin to develop uh, more complex uh, operations and parts, you'll find yourself uh, changing tools very frequently. You'll want to improve the fixturing on the machine improve your tolerances, and that will lead to subsequent changes. From a hardware perspective, you immediately will need to upgrade the, the platform uh, to something like the Saunders machine fixture plates and a ModVi system to give you some uh, enhanced accuracy and precision to hold tight, tighter tolerances. Changing your tools often on complex operations will leave you to busting your knuckles with the collet wrenches and constantly uh, touching off uh, for your, your tool length offsets. Uh, and that for one, uh, you know, leaves you wanting an ATC or being able to streamline that. The multiple tool changes per operation can increase your cycle times on being able to produce products off this. Now, this is never gonna compete with a Haas or a Tormach or something of an industrial caliber but it, it certainly is close enough to get you there if with a little investment. Um, and to make that investment, you're gonna need additional IO. Um, unfortunately, it seems like the Warhog electronics that the controller is built around uh, is very limited or value engineered for the commercial product that they were delivering. And that they could save money by eliminating some of that. And I'm not sure if that's what process they went through or if they just didn't want to include that extensibility. Um, it seems like uh, the previous generations of Shapoko were more open and they shared schematic and design aspects of it to allow the community to extend and grow with it. And maybe that was just to build their community. With the HDM, they seem a little bit more closed, they're more hardened, they're creating great products, but I don't feel like extensibility is something that they want to culture in their community. I've reached out to them several times to get uh, information about voltages and pinouts and things like that. And as, as you look through the forums, you probably see the theme that that's not something that is a core value that they're delivering on. Um, in terms of supporting the product, obviously they're the second to none. Uh, they have great support that fix anything that breaks. But if you're going to do stuff like I just did and void the, the warranty across the board, all bets are off. Not a problem though, because in order to uh, add an ATC or add uh, you know, a tool rack with pneumatics, um, it's going to require a, additional IO. And, and if the Warthog can't provide it, then you're going to have to either do it manually. I have lots of manual buttons to automate those uh, pneumatic features and functional fe features with tool changes and things like that. Um, you can go that route or you can find a new controller. And in terms of controllers, there's there's no shortage of those. There's probably 10 or so different open controllers, uh, machine controllers that you could 
pursuit that will provide that additional IO and each come with their own amount of complexity and how you set it up. If you're going to go with a new controller, chances are you're going to need uh, drivers and relays and everything of that nature, power supplies, VFD, everything uh, of that nature to create your technology stack for your machine controller. Um, now they have a nice and tidy little uh, retail hardened solution that's in their little, the box with the Warthog and the VFD um, and their uh, spindle interlock, um, which is a nice safety feature. And if you're going to replace that, then you have to come up with your own stack. Now, I think of the Warthog as a, a toaster microwave refrigerator, right? It's an all-in-one. It's disposable. If you ever need I.O. or additional capabilities, they either, uh, I'm not sure if they have some reserved pins that they could use for that functionality, possibly. Um, but you're going to have to wait for them to iterate on that hardware, release a new version for you to upgrade and get that capability on your machine. Um, aside from that, it's running the GRBL or Gerbil, if you, if you will, um, CNC controller implementation, which is limited in its support for G codes and M codes and functionality. So if you want to, uh, say, use a G68 to rotate your coordinate system, if you want to uh, adjust and compensate for uh, your tool paths uh, with, on, a, on the way that your part is mounted on your fixture plate, then you're not going to be able to do that with GRBL regardless of what software you use. It's a limitation of the controller and the hardware. So you, you got to get rid of the, the controller. That's my justification to finding a new controller and getting a new VFD for the ATC. The other limitation is the software, and that may be because of the limitations of the hardware. The software is overly simplified. They have basic probing functionality. It's not going to give you 3D probing. Uh, it's not going to automate some of the more complex probing operations. It's not very highly configurable aside from the MDI parameters. It's not, it doesn't seem to be a core deliverable of the product in terms of value. Uh, so whether you swap out the software um, to CNC.js or Linux CNC, it's never going to be able to do more than the controller uh, GRBL implementation is, is able to do. So software is out of the question as well. So in looking around at uh, other options for a new controller, a new spindle, new software, um, I came across CNC Drive. If you're not familiar with them, go to cncdrive.com. They've got a web shop. They sell lots of parts, drivers, control boards, um, extensible uh, I.O. boards that plug in to their controllers to add additional analog and digital GPIO. Uh, they also sell fully developed machines, um, larger scale sort of mid-grade industrial machines um, and mills, uh, which uh, opens up a lot of opportunities. What, what's better is they even offer a software package that's customizable that integrates with all of their hardware, which is called UCCNC. If you're not familiar with that, uh, you also want to dive into that, and we'll get into that a little bit later in the program. In addition to all the individual components of developing a, a new machine controller, they do sell complete control boxes. And for me, that was the best of both worlds to get a modular system that has extensible controller, uh, individual access drivers, um, power supplies in a modular pre-wired configuration that will allow me to swap them out or upgrade them as needed down the road as the as the machine evolves and initially to implement all of the functionality and capability that I'm looking to do for advanced probing um, as well as uh, ATC and pneumatic tool rack and all that fun stuff and additional relays and any anything to my heart's content and the nice side is uh, that they have Ethernet based controllers so you can communicate with them over your local area network as well as the software UCCNC is fully customizable and extensible with all G codes and M codes um, able to be developed in a .NET programming language, either VB or C Sharp. That allows you to in customize at such a low level um, that you can uh, specifically automate any characteristic of the machine's performance. In addition, UCCNC is highly configurable in terms of the settings that it provides, um, the motion planner, uh, and other capabilities and implementations that are specific to the hardware. 
the specific controller I went with was an AXBB E, which is an Ethernet version of their four axis controller. Now, for the Shea Poco, I've got two Y motors, so I'm going to use all four axis just on the X, Y, and Z. Um, but you can extend it and add additional drivers if you need to. Now, getting the pre wired control box with all of those modular systems with an AXBB in it is a big step in the right direction, but it's not going to address all of the ATC pneumatics. And for that, I needed to develop and wire a junction box with all of the pneumatic switches and map all of the wires from the existing HDM wiring harness over to the new control box. That's a lot of work. And in my particular strategy, I didn't want to cut any of the ends off any of the connectors. So at some point, if I decide to get rid of the machine entirely, I can uh, just plug back in the Warthog controller and sell it as is a HDM um, stock uh, model without having to snip any of the connectors or anything. So what I had to do is wire um, connectors that went to the existing uh, stepper motors and spindle motors and everything uh, and then wire that into a junction box and the junction box then was wired into the new control box. It's a lot of extra work but um, for the sake of reverse compatibility to swapping it out, it was nice to have. It also needed that space for the pneumatics and the wiring that differed from the new control box to the old Warthog control box. Now that said, in addition to that, uh, there were several, uh, a new 3D probe that was added uh, and signal mergers so that I could merge the signals of multiple uh, probe inputs for the tool offset, uh, the mobile probe switch, as well as the 3D probe that was spindle mounted. This video is not going to go into the details of all the specific parts that were required as much as to just show you an overview of what's capable should you want to drive it there. Upgrading the ATC was an additional challenge separate from the wiring of the machine. It required a four additional pneumatic lines to be ran to the spindle. These are responsible for opening the ATC clamp, releasing the tool, and sealing the ATC spindle. Um, there's lots of different functionality as well as clamping the tool in place. And so all of these pneumatics need to be coordinated at specific pressures uh, for specific time periods during the operation of the tool, whether you're changing it, whether you're running it, it also has additional sensors, so there are PNP sensors that are built into the spindle. And those determine the state of the clamp, whether the clamp's engaged and whether it's released properly during the tool change operations. And all of this needs to be taken into consideration during the tool change to ensure that it's completed successfully and the machine is in a safe state to run. So in order to have that, you need additional I.O. So while the AXBB uh, controller has a lot of GPIO, it handles your four axis and all of the motion planning um, successfully. It also has a parallel port that extends its capability by buying an additional breakout board. You can, there's several different options that they offer. I went with the UCSB, which adds, I believe, 14 additional IO ports, a couple, some of which are analog, most of which are digital. That allows you to add additional relays for your pneumatics as well as read the sensors from your ATC switch and all of that fun stuff that makes all of this possible. Now I'm grossly minimizing the complexity and planning that went into this and I suspect down the road if there's interest we'll dive into each of these whether the junction box or the the extensions on the wired controller box or the signal merger for the probes and all that capability but today we're just giving an overview to kind of show you the general work that went into it and the functionality that was gained from it so all of this work that went into this is going to roughly double the price of the hdm and that's no thanks to imported products the spindle alone was fourteen hundred dollars and because it was imported from china department of homeland security charged an extra five hundred dollars just to get it to my door which is still less than a domestic ATC spindle with the comparable specs. So if you have recommendations or spindle ATC spindles that you've seen found domestically that will work uh, similar to this model, uh, I'd love to see in the comments. Please provide feedback down there. For now, I'm using this Junkin spindle. 
which was recommended by Peter Fox on his YouTube channel. You may be familiar with him. He's got the Granite CNC DIY build. He's went through a pretty uh, good overview of Chinese sp ATC spindles and compared them. I'm very happy with the spindle. It's near silent compared to the stock HDM spindle. Um, in this case, I stuck with 1.5 kilowatt. I don't have a problem with the power of the machine. I don't have a cycle time or a need for the additional torque. Uh, but the control box did improve, uh, even further improve uh, the strength of the stepper motors by stepping it up to 48 volt stepper motor uh, drivers which gives it a little bit more strength and ability to run at higher rapids. Um, for example, this machine can run up to 12 to 15,000 inches per minute uh, on the 48 volts without missing steps. Uh, so that's uh, been really exciting, at least in terms of moving, rapiding around on the machine and getting it set up and probing and things like that. So once the controller was upgraded, the junction box was implemented, the probing signal mergers and the ATC spindle was installed. Uh, there was some basic programming that was required on the VFD to be compatible with the spindle. I also used the relay again to uh, work with the water cooling and light pole that I had installed previously uh, to give some visual feedback if the pump's not on before we turn on the spindle and things like that. Now all of the functionality for the ATC would be responsible or handled by the M6 uh, script. In UCCNC, you can upgrade any aspect of the user interface. You can change the labels on buttons or the graphics in the background, the layout of the screen and the tabs that are displayed or just about anything um, by customizing it in the app. You can add new buttons, you can change graphics or labels, uh, and obviously you can tie those those graphics and buttons to uh, M code functionality or G code functionality or additional plugins. It's, it's a highly extensible front end. Uh, and you can package that all, all up in what's referred to as a screen set. This is very similar to what Mach 3 does. And I'm not sure which one came first, but they're very similar in nature in terms of design and functionality. Uh, the macros, though, as they're developed in a .NET technology, either VB or C Sharp, they're compiled in real time. So when, say, the M6 is called, the script is compiled before it's used, and then it's used. So it's like a just-in-time compilation. Alternatively, you can pre-compile all these. That speeds it up a little bit if you need that extra um, performance. So for the M6 macro, there was a lot of functionality that was already accomplished by others in the community. The UCCNC community is fairly large. There's lots of different uh, uh, engineers and machinists and developers that are contributing, but it's not an open source project. Uh, the macros and plugins are open in regards to being able to develop your own, and there are several that have been developed by other folks, like bed leveling uh, macros to adjust your tool paths and digitizing capabilities, which allow you to uh, capture probe points, um, which is useful for integration with things like Fusion 360, where one of your operations may be an inspection to collect some data points on your part after you've performed an operation. And then by collecting those data points from the probing operation or inspection operation, you can feed that back into Fusion 360 to adjust and accommodate to make sure that your part stays in tolerance. Uh, that was a, a later upgrade. It won't be covered in this, but that's a later uh, development effort that I invested in writing and upgrading the post processor to accommodate these probing capabilities and inspection operations in Fusion 360 natively as part of your um, part operation tool chain. So it's really cool stuff. We'll get to that in a later video. So once your software um, logic has been upgraded for your M6, um, which defines where all of your tools are and you set them up in a static tool changer. Uh, for me, the HDM already loses about six to eight inches because the rear gantry doesn't, doesn't get full utilization uh, in the Y axis. And that's because of the design of the, the Y gantry uh, rails, I guess. Um, like Stepcraft, uh, freeze up the table so that you can get full milling table. Uh, unfortunately, the HDM, that's one of the downfalls of its design is you lose about six to eight inches. You can use it for clamping, but your spindle is never, ever, never gonna be able to get that far back. 
So I didn't want to put a static tool rack on the table and lose another six inches. So for me, I wanted a pneumatic tool rack that would uh, extend and retract when necessary to change the tool. I didn't want a, a static tool rack on the fixture table that could you could crash into, for example. And that's obviously a hazard uh, because there's no spindle awareness uh, in this sort of setup. So unless you create soft limits that prevent it from going there until there is an M6, um, then you can digit conditionally uh, you know, configure the safety of that region. But for my particular implementation, I wanted a pneumatic tool rack to hide in the back in the dead area so they can only interfere with the fixture table uh, when a tool change was in operation. And so that required some design of some linear rails and a tool rack using some 1020 extrusion and some custom 3D printed uh, tool holders. This ATC spindle that I went with has an ISO 20 uh, tool holder and I went with a mix of ER20 and ER16 collets to provide uh, the functionality for the tools and the range and size of shanks that I would be using on this machine. With the tool rack assembled and completed, it was just a matter of setting up an additional pneumatic switch as well as uh, some air cylinders that would conditionally push it out based on the pin state of the AXBB and the UCSB controller implementation. With that implementation all wired up through the junction box, it's just a matter of logically enabling or disabling that pin to perform that tool rack, tool change functionality. So going back into the M6 macro, I added additional capability to extend the rack before the tool was picked up and to retract the rack after the tool change is complete which added a level of automation that kept the tools clean, uh, kept them out of the way, and automated the tool chains to prevent me from uh, using the call-out wrenches and busting my knuckles six or eight times per job. So in addition to the ATC spindle functionality and the tool change functionality with the pneumatic tool rack, there's, there's always cases that uh, require manual intervention, and for that, for some custom macros created that would allow me to manually extend and retract the rack. And that was associated to a custom button on my interface to give me the tools and functionality that I need to automate um, all of this, this setup. In addition to the extend and retract, there's also M31 on all tools, which is a macro that will run through all of the tools and compare them to the master tool to ensure that the tool length offsets for all of the tools on the rack are set up um, automatically so that when I go to use them I no longer need to do a tool length offset probe they're automatically uh, kept in the tool table which uh, speeds up that process even more in addition to the a ATC functionality there's additional uh, buttons for vacuum and lighting and just about anything else that you'd like to do with the machine and the IO is there to support it with addition by adding additional relays analog inputs or digital inputs with that, let's show some video of the machine running through a tool change M31 on all tools to show the functionality of how it picks up the tool, how it retracts the tool rack, and then runs to the touch probe. In this case, obviously it's not ideal because my touch probe is in the far right corner. Um, at some point I may move it, but it's okay for me to have that there at this point because the M31 only needs to occur once when any tools are changed. And you really only need to run the M31 on the tool that's changed. Once they've been all offset correctly, uh, you don't need to do that unless you change out. So through the automation, 
you can see the, the machine picking up the tool, uh, calculating the tool offset, as well as uh, extending and retracting the tool rack. Next, let's jog the machine around using this MPG hand wheel, um, which will demonstrate uh, the functionality and change in axis and speed and moving the gantry around at a, a high feed rate. Um, this handheld MPG or pendant, whatever you want to call it, uh, was pretty useful. The design's a little clunky, but it works very well. It's got safety switch to enable or disable the buttons uh, so that you can't accidentally move it while the machine's in operation without intentionally uh, depressing the safety switch. So that said, uh, this thing can jog around really quickly. And the motion planner of the controller is really nice, although it's optional. This particular motion planner will accelerate um, from point to point at the expense of tolerance. And so you can configure um, the tolerance, desired tolerance on the motion planner so that basically if you give it an S curve in your toolpath, it will uh, cut corners within reason um, based on your configurable parameters. Uh, 
the nicety of that is that it accelerates and decelerates um, at the beginning and end point, uh, which allows your machine to ease into its uh, corners a little bit better and handle the load on the spindle and end mill more effectively. If you need really extremely tight precision and tolerances, then you can disable the motion planner to eliminate that acceleration. But it's really nice when you're jogging around or high feeds and speeds um, for it to relax uh, a little bit in the acceleration around corners to reduce the load. Now, obviously, that's going to change your chip load, uh, and that's all susceptible. I haven't had seen any really downsides to that other than uh, it seems like you can run it a little bit faster because the, uh, the acceleration takes some of the harshness out of the toolpath, if that makes sense. Now, another upgrade that I added to this machine, which is intentional, was to add the 3D probe. Um, in addition to the 3D probe, we obviously have the bit setter, which is the stock uh, carbide 3D bit setter, which is great for the tool probe. But you need to reference uh, that height to your, your work height. And for that, I use a mobile probe. The mobile probe and the touch 3D touch probe were both bought from topcom.cz. If you're not familiar with them, they make minimalistic sort of probes uh, for desktop CNCs. Uh, with, in this case, they have magnetic connectors. They also offer wired connectors. The ma magnetic connectors are nice because I can switch between the 3D probe and the mobile probe. Now all of these probes get wired back up into a signal merger which allows me to share the same pin for all of the probes at the same time. They also have safety, which although UCCNC has a or jog safe probing, which stops the machine if the probe signal goes high um, when a jog or rapid is in place, which will prevent you from crashing your probe and breaking the tip off and just all bad things. So that said, uh, the signal merger, the mobile probe, the 3D probe from topcom.cz, go check them out. Um, they also sell lots of adapters and uh, different length probes, ruby tipped probes as you see on mine, um, that will get you uh, more reach out of the tool, if you will. Now in this case, the 3D probe was primarily going to be used for inspection or stock uh, indexing. So UCCNC has lots of capabilities to probe using a 3D probe, whether it's the external corner or an internal boss or, or feature of your part um, or a bore. It will uh, provide all of that capability for you. You just have to enter a few parameters so that it knows which axis uh, you're dealing with from simple to complex probes. Uh, the functionality uh, requires a little bit more thought when you're leveraging it so as not to perform the wrong <laughs> axis or operation or depth of probe, but the flexibility is priceless. In addition to the standard probing capabilities and multi-axis probing capabilities that are there, uh, you can also digitize, which will allow you to, say, do a surface uh, leveling automation on something like a circuit board so that you can calculate out the anomalies in the surface uh, and adjust your tool path to get great results. So that said, the core functionality of probing that was added by this upgrade was everything I had hoped for and also sort of opened the doors for the inspection and probing operations from Fusion 360. Now if you go into the Fusion 360 post-processor, you'll see that the UCCNC post-processor and hardly any other post-processors support inspection or probing. And that's because the logic hasn't been integrated in the post-process script to perform those capabilities. Now, if you're familiar with the post-process SDK, um, there's good, great documentation that explains the layout and structure of it. It's basically a JavaScript file that leverages APIs um, that are exposed by the Fusion 360 engine when uh, your design is being processed to generate toolpaths. But any customization that you want to do to that or capability that you want to add to that, it's going to require you to under the, understand the SDK, to dive into the software development kit and understand uh, the implementation and logistics. And their documentation does a pretty good job 
of explaining uh, how you implement specific features like probing or inspection. In my particular case, uh, the probing algorithm was implemented pretty uh, easily in the post-processor and the inspection implementation, uh, the difference between probing and inspection is that the inspection is going to collect data. Probing is going to adjust your work coordinate system offset based on the probing operations. So the inspection and the collection of data is something that wasn't previously possible by the HDM. But given the UC, CNC, and the AXBB, there's functionality to collect probe points and store them in a file. And some of that configuration setting is in the UC CNC settings page. Uh, and that will, on G31 commands, um, save the, pr the probe position in a text file, either comment delimited, you determine the number of axes that you want to collect and all of that important information. Um, so then it's just a matter of enabling or disabling the UCCNC digitizing capability to collect those points and then generating the G code from the post processor to instruct those operations to occur. So it's not trivial. Um, but the documentation is good, and if you understand UC CNC, once you get in and, and familiarize yourself with the G40 and the G41, which enable or disable digitizing, then that was pretty straightforward to implement. It took about a day for me to implement, and I'm continuing to test it. It's not completely functional yet, but it's very close. So that said, um, that's a lot of information, a lot of capability, and future extensibility that the machine is now set up for. We've got a new controller, we've got the junction box that will allow me to dynamically change it, uh, sensor input or I.O. input or uh, motor output if I want to swap out to servos or something else like that at some point, or enhance the uh, analog inputs based on additional sensors that are added to the machine. Uh, any of that functionality is possible with this new configuration. Now, at some point, I'll pull together a part list if it's of interest. Um, for now, I'm going to place the resources that I leveraged uh, to research and develop the functionality, uh, find the right hardware to implement. A lot of the pneumatics and, and pneumatic uh, valves were all Amazon purchases. They're pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, the air regulators and filters uh, were important to keep moisture out of your spindle and things like that. Uh, the existing water or spindle cooler was used. Um, but I'll put a lot of those references and resources in the description below and help you out. If you have any questions, by all means, uh, you can tell me how crazy I am or how useless this is. But for me, it's exactly what I was looking for. This, this machine with its additional capabilities and more importantly, extensibility for future change uh, is, is great. It allows me to own those M6s and those macro functionalities that I can create and change and modify to meet my very specific needs of how I want to use the machine. Now, that's taken about three months to develop and implement all of these changes. And to that regard, I'm happy that I'm at a stage to where the machine is, is fully functional, entirely done for the most part, right? And so now I can get back to making projects uh, and actually utilizing the functionality without all the encumbrances of manual tool changes and limitations of functionality and probing. Uh, this is an exhaustive and more comprehensive solution that will uh, allow you to be more efficient and automated in the way you leverage a machine and platform like the HDM. Now at some point, whether or not they incorporate some of this functionality and bring it to market, that sure would be nice. This is a complex endeavor if you choose to take it on yourself. I'll share some of the design files of the components that were custom made for the tool rack and things like that. Um, some of the schematics potentially. Um, so let me know if you're interested in that. Leave some comments below. If you like this particular video, give it a thumbs up. If you enjoy the channel, please subscribe. It helps it in a number of ways. In the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too.